to give us uh, uh, an overview of, of the books you've just edited. But tonight we have an interesting uh, presentation, a documentary film I guess would be the best, uh, although it, it seems to surpass documentary film and its artistry as well. So uh, we have with us tonight uh, two of the producers of the film, um, Troubled Waters, uh, Voices from Bath, which is a, a, an essay on controlling the environment that, that is yours uh, and, and working with those who would, uh, who would alter it for one reason or another. Uh, but uh, we have two of the, uh, direct of the team that produced the film, uh, Barbara uh, to the left there and uh, Julian McBain here. Uh, and I'm going to let them introduce uh, the film for you and then we'll screen the film. After the film has played, we'll have time for uh, questions and answers and they'll be here to, uh, uh, to take care of that for you. So I'm going to get out of the way. Julian, Barbara. Thanks so much. Can you hear me okay? Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for doing that, Alan. People get us confused, so <laughs> um, <laughs> it's really good to have that cleared. Um, yeah, so my name is Barb Adams. Uh, I'll just give a little bit of background about myself, although I'm not ever sure what to say. But I think the part that's relevant to this is because I have a background in biology from Georgia Mason University, but also a background in music. And uh, throughout my life, I've sort of collaborated on the science and the art of different aspects of the world. And I've uh, spent a lot of time um, figuring out where to apply those, both, both of those interests together. Um, I also a wildlife rehabber. So for those of you that are interested in wildlife, that was one of the ways that I really spent my time taking care of being very involved and in seeing close up the effect of um, habitats on um, animals. I think I'll stop there and let Julian introduce himself. Hi, so. yes, Julian, not Barb. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I got involved with this. I graduated in film from VCU, um, from Richmond, which is where I met Barb um, and some other great folks. Uh, and yeah, I think you came to me and there's a third member um, of the core team who couldn't be here tonight, uh, another student at the time, and yeah, you met us and came to us with this great idea for what seemed like an adventure, and definitely was an adventure, but uh, yeah, it turned into this, and I don't think we want to say too, too much, and just let it speak for itself, but thank you all for coming here. Yeah, also wanted to thank Alan um, Hoyleman and the curator and Kendall, Kendall Basemore, a friend who has also been integral in creating this program for the museum. Um, I will just a little bit uh, uh, before we start, just say that this, uh, this film was really an exploration. And um, uh, I think that it's looking at people, people and their, how their lives are affected just in general. Um, and we can talk more about all of that. But also, this was an amateur film to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> this is the disclaimer. disclaimer. <laughs> um, we haven't gotten any, you know, requests to be part of the, you know, Academy. Um, but so we just, um, we'll, we'll, we'll stop there and run the film and hope um, we have some lively discussion afterwards. Thank you. I know that it's very controversial. I have not. What do you think about natural gas uh, as an energy source? I don't. <laughs> I don't. I've never, never thought about that. It depends. Good. I mean, maybe not how we use it. It's better than oil, but I still don't think it's the right thing. What about fracking? Do you know much about yeah, fracking? Yeah, fracking really scared me. I know some people in the oil business who think it's a good thing. They feel like it's a cleaner way to get oil. It's picking up a little bit of steam. You know, there's controversy about the environment, what it can do to the environment, so. I have mixed feelings about fracking. Um, I think that it's 
probably, from what I understand, better than oil. But at the same time, um, I think that it can really disrupt the community. It's yep. really common in my state. Ah, so where are you from? Oklahoma. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And um, what are your thoughts about fracking as a method? It's really bad. And what about pipelines? What do you think about natural gas pipelines? Um, it's a good thing they're underground. Mm. <laughs> There's so much about this area that's just magical. It's paradise for us. I mean, love the scenery. Best air quality we've ever seen. Quietest place we've ever seen. Cleanest water we've ever seen. It's an idyllic place to live. It inspires me to look for something more meaningful. Wonderful, beautiful, fresh air. Heartbreakingly beautiful. I would trade it for any amount of money. Everything around here is beautiful, I think, and don't want to change, basically. If you follow the history of the valley, it's sort of a history of this country, in a way, as far as people coming out to the frontier, trying to find a way to make a living and doing it. I'm a broom maker and I personally have lived in the valley for almost 30 years. We grew up farming. My, my granddad and, and my grandma uh, this place here. And uh, they bought it about uh, 75 years ago. I grew up on a farm, so I grew up with all that stuff. My mom grew up with all that stuff. Her dad, her dad's dad and mom. Mm -hmm. That's all we know. Yeah, growing up here, I mean, as you can see, I mean, this, this was our lives and this is our lives. You know, we lived off the land. It wasn't no going to Walmart. We're the last of the diehard farmers in this area. My husband leases a land up and down river. We run beef cattle and sheep. My husband and I moved back here in 74. We built this little rancher and uh, been on this farm ever since. Great place to live my entire life. Uh, I mean, we've traveled. And, uh, you know, I haven't found a place yet I want to move. <laughs> my father bought this property in 1959. And it was his wishes that he conveyed to me is that we are merely caretakers of this land. Fort Lewis is really an exceptional piece of property. And it was settled by early pioneers, Charles Lewis, who then went on to die a hero's death and what's now termed revolutionary action. And the Lewis family was here for 100 years. They built a grist mill. They were center of this whole community. And we're just here for X number of years and David will be here longer and hopefully he'll pass it on. I had just great memories from growing up and then went away to college and uh, had lived in New York for a number of years. It just didn't feel right and it wasn't uh, sort of part of me and how I grew up and you know now I've, I've sort of decided to get back to my roots and I'm really happy to be here. The land here, uh, you know, when I first came here, um, I was amazed that it uh, has been preserved the way it has been. It's been in the same family for all of these years, and it's something that uh, every member of the family respects and tries to preserve. My family's been here since 1792. The way I'm connected is through my grandmother, uh, 
who lived on the farm. She loved the farm. It was her life. You ain't got nothing like this where you live, right? Dipsy Hebner in Burnsville, Virginia. I was born and raised here. We amused ourselves with kids by playing, fishing, hunting, or whatever. Fished in the creek all my life. It was a it was an emotional decision, uh, mm -hmm. more emotional and more practical. But uh, hey, we uh, we made the right decision. I came out here without knowing anything about this area, mm -hmm. and just was so happy to find a place where I could just feel so utterly at home. Whether we grew up in the area and were local, or whether we retired and moved here, as Joe and I did, the dreams are the same, and you want to be in an environment that's safe. It just seems as though the environment that's unique to this area is the worst possible place to pull the pipeline. The Atlantic Coast Pipeline is part of a pretty large uh, infrastructure that's being built in Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania to first frack gas and then to transport it through a pipeline into new gas-fired power plants that are being built by Dominion and Duke in West Virginia and North Carolina. What's remarkable about the pipeline, I think, in terms of what happens in Bath County is that FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, will uh, issue a certificate of necessity and convenience to show that uh, the pipeline is necessary. You know, the way FERC operates is they just assume that if a pipeline has um, contracts with shippers who are willing to ship gas on the pipeline, then the pipeline must be needed. Um, and what we're finding in a lot of cases, including the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, is that the same company is on both sides of that transaction. The fact is, Dominion intended this valley didn't exist. When they first came out with the new route description, this valley was not even mentioned at all. And they actually gave an inaccurate description of which mountains it would cross. You can't put in a 42-inch pipe in the ground through rivers and over mountains without causing permanent scarring and permanent disruption. And it's all for a, a money-making proposition. I don't think that our governor has the will to enforce the environmental safeguards that, that should be in place. They don't know what they're doing. They cannot come over that mountain. The Dominion is, is saying, we will restore this area to its natural beauty. Well, I think that's impossible. Of course, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline says they've got the state-of-the-art controls and the environment will be protected. Everything will be fine. <laughs> Imagine a scar. Imagine a scar. Imagine living with the, the idea of a possible explosion. I don't think people want to come and see marred mountaintops. It would be like a permanent disfigurement of the face of a loved one. What makes this area so unique, it's a tourist county. And so there's been commitments that people have made to ensure that tourism will always be a vital part of the equation. Having a 42-inch pipeline um, with a 125-foot right away coming right down the middle of the property is going to damage the business in the short term, and in the long term, it's going to be a reputational damage. The tourism is what keeps us from being some of the areas of Virginia where there is no more industry where you see the massive unemployment. Anything that damages our sort of economic ecosystem you know, can damage the whole community, can shut the whole community down. I would bet that most of the jobs affiliated with, associated with the pipeline will be the construction crews coming in here from other places. It'll be temporary at the best. Another issue that I would like to speak to is the decline of farmland. As we, our population increases, we need more food to feed the people. Farmland is so compromised anyhow by development. This pipeline is directly uh, 
contrary to the Fifth Amendment of the United States, which very clearly provides that private land and private property cannot be taken for a public person. Dominion can send someone to survey your property, and if it is declared this is a, a need that's a strong enough need for the viability and the well-being of the community, your property can be seized. We tell that to people and they say, what, they can do that? Yes, they can. Well, that's un-American, is the kind of the answer we get from people. Well, apparently not, it's American. They're gonna do it, and they're gonna do it to thousands of people if they can uh, get away with it. When you look at the laws that are on the books that allow this company to come through here and take private property for a private gain, which is basically what's happening here. Uh, it's because of the influence of money and politics that allows these types of things to be legal. They're, they are legal. That doesn't mean they're moral. I think that uh, pipeline companies should have to at least show that there is a real need for the project before eminent domain is used, and uh, Dominion will not have to show that. It's highly likely that there's going to be an overbuilding of pipelines um, in the Marcellus, so more pipelines built than uh, natural gas available. And industry folks uh, in the natural gas industry and the pipeline industry are pretty explicit that they expect pipelines to be overbuilt. I've heard people already say that if the pipeline goes through, I'm moving out of the counties. If this pipeline goes through, um, we can't stay here. Most of the people on this pipeline are in the same boat. You bet. You know? um, I think they would be very hard pressed to to sell their, their properties. I don't even know if we could ever sell it. No. I mean, who would buy it? They're going to have extensive roads that they have to push in to be able to work and get the thing in and get the pipe in the ground and that kind of thing. There's another huge amount of uh, destruction to the land around us. If the proposed pipeline goes into the Little Valley, the next valley, that's a rural rustic road with bridges that won't hold much weight. The idea of Dominion being able to haul 40-foot sections of four-foot pipe up here and other things that they would have to, you know, the heavy equipment, they'd have to rebuild this road. They would destroy the road as it is. The state's cut back tremendously on the highway system. Route 220 corridor, um, and you know all this equipment stuff. There's gonna be busting asphalt, just the weight of it. And their reply was they'd be monitoring it. Atlantic Coast Pipeline says it's a safe way to transport natural gas. We don't believe it for a minute. Over the last five years, on the average, once. A week, there's been a, a death, a hospitalization, or severe property damage from a gas pipeline, especially a 42 inch high pressure gas pipeline. Never before been put through terrain like this before. And some of these areas will be, you will be creating pinnacles, which means you have voids on either side of the pipeline and a big sharp column sticking up in the middle. So what happens is there's a bending moment created around that pinnacle, which you know, could snap, break that pipeline. So what happens? You have a big explosion in the ground. If it's in a forested area, you're gonna have a wildfire. If you're in a residential community, it would be disastrous. I don't think anyone has even addressed that. I think they're all taking the position that these pipelines are perfectly safe and that they don't explode. I am the fire chief and mm -hmm. I'll be the one showing up if it blows up. If something ever happens with that pipeline, I said, we don't we don't have the manpower, we don't have the equipment. You know, it's one of them what ifs. There isn't another pipeline that I know of that will be as destructive as the Atlanta. Coast pipeline because of the region that it's going through the mountains, the cars, the rivers, and streams. Why not go ahead and have a programmatic environmental impact study? Look at all the pipelines in the area and be able to say to residents, we've really looked at this. We know you're upset. Yes, we're acting you to be the sacrificial lamb here. When 120 
five feet of trees are removed up that steep incline, um, there has to be erosion of the sediment no matter what. You're going to rip it wide open, you're going to get down to bare soil, they're going to put in a pipe, they're going to cover it back up, they're going to plant it, and it's going to take months and months and months and years for this those plantings, that grass, to get back to the point where it comes even close to keeping soil from eroding. Some of these slopes that they're talking about going over, there's very, very little topsoil. And that once that's scraped away, you're down to basically limestone rock. There's nothing there. You, you're, you're not going to restore that. Well, if you expose all the soil, then you have only a 10% slope you're going to get about 34 tons of soil eroded per acre per year. Problem is that this pipeline is going to go over mountain after mountain after mountain with slopes in excess of 30% and up to 80%. Native plants and native species that can be damaged and are um, may disappear, the fragmentation of pipelines going to cause, um, that all impacts the organisms, and I'm, I'm speaking of animals, plants, uh, that, are, that are living in these areas now, and you cannot restore that. We have a lot of um, spring-fed uh, streams that come in and keep the water relatively cold, and so our trout stay all summer. We have spiny mussels, which are highly endangered, almost extinct. They can't tolerate sediment. The sedimentation is not good for all kinds of wildlife. It kills the more sensitive macroinvertebrates that are in the water, which are used as a barometer of water quality by the state. It compromises the breeding of fish particularly the native brook trout. It kills various types of uh, crustaceans and mollusks. There are some areas you can't mitigate your way through or compensate your way through. You just have to go around. Uh, one of them, for instance, is the Burnsville Cove. Due to the endangered bats in the cave, there are at least five federally or state endangered bats. There are federal laws and state laws that protect them but it's whether or not the state feels that they're endangered by the pipeline. As a general rule, in the northern part of the uh, Cowcaster River, the water quality is equal or better than most of the water coming into any municipal water supply uh, that you'd like to talk about. In this area, we're at the headwaters for a number of rim rivers that go to Richmond. So to me, everybody in Richmond ought to be paying attention if you care about water quality. We're afraid that they're going to hurt the car systems. Cars. 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 Karst is essentially a landscape that's formed by solution as opposed to just regular mechanical weathering. So what we mean, we get a slightly acid water that falls as rain, uh, sometimes is captured in a stream sink, and it percolates down through secondary fractures in a soluble rock. Around here, that's going to be limestone. We can see one slightly kind of sloping crack fracture in the rock that's called a bedding plane party. And then there's some vertical fractures here. And these small caves that you see uh, right at river level are formed mostly in those vertical planes. So the water needs, or will seek out a slightly easier way to go. And as it works its way through these fractures, it slowly dissolves away the limestone. This takes thousands of years. We're still finding new caves, we're still exploring. Uh, with 50 years of intensive study, we're still finding new things that we didn't know. So if I had to make a list, I guess, of 
geohazards associated with construction and cars. I think just the fact that we never know everything would be pretty close to the top of the list. We have dye traces in Bath County and Highland and Bath that are six and a half miles long. I think the longest dye trace is somewhere around eight miles. So in some cases, you might have to look at the cars eight miles north and south of the uh, uh, right-of-way. Dominion has built smaller pipelines out in West Virginia. And what we saw was a uh, history of sedimentation events where off of the pipeline right-of-way, uh, sediments were washed into creeks. Clean water, that's the biggest threat that many of us see with the pipeline coming through. But that's the key thing, and it boils down to groundwater. The springs in this area are all interconnected. And a lot of times the water isn't that deep. Mm. And if they wanted to put the pipeline in, that would be probably 18 feet to get a nice bed. Oh my God. I'd say I would probably lose every spring on this property. Anything six miles downstream of that can be affected be it by sedimentation or totally closing off the source of the spring so that if it goes dry, suddenly you turn on the tap, there's no water. When it's gone, it could be gone forever. So if we have no water here, we have nothing. Dominion admits that solar energy is less expensive in Virginia than natural gas is right now, but it won't make as much money on solar. We can't keep doing what we've always done, and that we owe it to our children and those who come after us to have the courage now to do something different. People in this region who would like to see solar energy instead of fossil fuels should fight these pipelines. Bath County and the Blue Ridge Mountains, I mean, these are some of the most scenic and beautiful landscapes that I've ever seen. This is the last frontier. I've seen it. You need to do everything in your power to hold on to this. There's so many people who feel so strongly, and their reasons for feeling so strongly against it are not having to do with money. If we could get government officials to come actually stay here and be still long enough to hear the voice without and the voice within, then we could really have a conversation. When you think about it, it's taken thousands of years <laughs> to create this, what we have, and it takes so little time to destroy it. I, I, I love it so much, and I want to see it stay how I know it. This is chopped up into bits. All I can say is that I know that when that flower blooms over there, it affects me. And if that affects me, then this affects the whole world on some level. And not everyone will understand that. It's a good place. <laughs>
battle turn of energy. That's better. Uh, so what we're going to do, some questions and answers. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Keep them focused. Keep them pointed. Um, and uh, our producers here, will, uh, directors, will uh, answer them as best they can. I will be circulating uh, with a microphone because we are recording this for Facebook Live, or we're broadcasting and recording. So uh, I will come to you with the microphone, hand you the microphone, ask you questions. They'll answer. And then I'll retrieve the microphone and move on to the next question. So I see a hand up over here. So that's where I'm While going. While you're walking over there, I do want to give credit to our third filmmaker, which is Sam Wright, who wasn't able to be here today, and also Lee Brower, who was a partner in all of this and a photographer and did many of the photographs and a resident of Bath County. And it's because of him that we ended up, we were asked to come to do this. So just want you to know. Very good. Thank you for the great film. Uh, didn't the uh, pipeline just win on, in, a, in a month or two ago? They won at one level or something? Are you talking about the Atlantic Coast pipeline? Uh, so that's why I'm asking for an update. What, what's well, the update? The, in this particular situation, the Atlantic Coast pipeline was not built. So um, there was a... Yeah. <laughs> it was a really uh, important... Um, I think it was one of the few pipelines that had ever been started and gotten to that process and then stopped. Um, unfortunately, there are other um, pipelines in Virginia that, are st that will go through Virginia that are still in the process. Um, and there are people just like these people here whose lives were affected. They didn't, they didn't know what was coming and they're still working to try to protect um, what they have. Yeah, I know the uh, Mountain Valley Pipeline is still a big one that people are fighting. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, it was included. Does anyone, I, I'm happy to bring some experts into the, the um, Charles, Jeff. That, uh, that pipeline, uh, Mountain Valley Pipeline. Thank you. The Mountain Valley Pipeline um, was attached to a bill that was going to uh, go through to uh, make the debt ceiling rise had no business being in there, but it was done nevertheless. It was like a, uh, a deal between Manchur, um, Manchin and Schumer and uh, President Biden. So that got attached to it. And what it did was it stripped judicial review away from government agencies and the Fourth Circuit Court of Virginia. So this is a direct attack on democracy, in my opinion. Um, and it only included the Mountain Valley Pipeline. It was a sweetheart deal for them. They stripped our rights away so that they could push this thing through and their investors could make a ton of money. So that was, uh, the Fourth Circuit Court said, we're not gonna buy this. So they went ahead and stopped it again. And recently the Supreme Court has said that that was a uh, legal um, way of doing things. How they come to that conclusion? <laughs> They said that it was okay that uh, Congress took away their authority to, uh, to uh, look over these pipelines. They claim it's a national necessity, um, and it's, it's not. So, oh no, uh, matter of fact, we're all meeting up in the mountains of uh, West Virginia next month to uh, f make plans to fight it, institute some new uh, new tactics, and uh, yeah, so it, we're not giving up, yeah. All right. No, 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 no that's, that's okay. great, good, good update. Anyone? Yes. 
All right. Um, well, we're recording. I won't give you a microphone. How's that? You could around. Flip it. Flip it. Yeah. Ah, there's the route. Yeah, there's the route. And I've been to Bath County dozens of times for uh, things, and uh, so they're going to have a special treat and zigzag and where the line is going to go. There's going to be court cases, and because they're going to detour, because they're going to find out where they've drawn the line that they can't. And tell me what what pipeline are you referring to? What's the Atlantic Coast pipeline that was uh, portion? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thank you so much for sharing um, your perspective, really. Mm -hmm. yep. Hey, Barb, how you doing? Hey, Charles. How's everybody? How y'all doing? Um, just a quick question. I'm a really big fan of just documentaries just in general, and so to be here to see an environmental documentary and one on pipeline specifically is uh, great for me. What I really want to know is when you guys decided that you guys wanted to do this project, what is the first, I guess, the first meeting? Can you guys kind of take us through that? Like, I, I'm a nerd in that kind of way, so like, was it like, oh, we gotta do this, let's jump on it, or did you pick on uh, just different uh, topics and this is the specific pipeline or project you guys decided, and what was the planning out of how you guys decided to jump into it? Oh my gosh. I can answer that question. I don't think, <laughs> that is like the best question that nobody has ever <laughs> so thank you, Charles. Well planned. Did you? <laughs> did, they, did they set you up? <laughs> well, I just think it is a beautiful story yeah. because um, some of the background is, as um, as Jillian said, we were at an event mm. and I had just spoken with um, one of the residents that was living in Bath County. He and his wife had sold everything in Richmond, bought their dream home. And then within a year, they got a letter from Dominion saying that the pipeline was going to come through their property in a, in a dead-end valley, meaning that if anything happened, there was no way out, right? So there was only one. There wasn't like a road through it. So uh, That was Lee, right? That the was Lee Brower, the some photographer. Of the, some of the photos. So Lee knew that I was, did stuff like this, so he said, what are we going to do? And um, I... I said, well, you're a photographer. Why don't you go take nice pictures, and we can talk about what could be changed by that. And so he thought that was a good idea. Then he said, well, as he met people, because they were new residents, people were talking about their history, their connection with the land. You know, like the, um, Jeanette said, it, when it was her family. Actually, it was Robert E. Lee's father bequeathed the land to her ancestors. So we're going back hundreds and hundreds of years. So their connection with the land was very deep. And so 
Lee and I talked, he said, well, let's do audio. I've done audio recording. Let's make an audio tape of everybody's stories, and we'll play that with the photo exhibit. So this is for the nerd, okay? <laughs> so, and then I met Julian. I met a bunch of young folks um, at, the, at this uh, event. Yeah. And I was standing there holding a sign saying, hey, does anybody want to do something in Bath County. <laughs> and, and then, uh, yeah, me and Sam, the other uh, filmmaker, just happened to be taking video at this uh, action, this, like, you know, um, climate justice action that we were doing as students. And, yeah, you were like, hey, you guys have cameras and you're into this sort of thing. Like, why don't we talk? <laughs> and so that first meeting was really incredible. Mm -hmm. We met at a coffee shop and we talked about uh, well, Julian being the filmmaker, we were talking about all these things, and Julian said, well, can we make a film? And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done that before. So we talked about what, uh, what this film is asking to tell. It was really like, it wasn't we decided what was going to be there. Um, it was about people and their stories. So I think the most interesting thing uh, for people is to hear about people and their stories. So that's what we decided that we would pursue in some way, but we didn't know exactly how, but we just knew that that was what was, we were being called to do. Yeah, yeah, I think we wanted it to feel collaborative, both with the people that we were going to hear and like just record their stories, uh, and as well as just like the natural beauty um, of the land. We just wanted to, yeah, really just capture the story and the voice of, you know, that's why it's Voices from Bath. It's like trying to capture all the voices there. And yeah, and the natural setting of Bath is another story. Yeah. I mean, it's ancient, right? Those waters are ancient, and the mountains are ancient. Yeah. So they're another story that we wanted to somehow capture, mostly through the filming and yeah. the photo photographs. I mean, this honestly could have been 26 minutes of just landscape and water <laughs> and mountains. <laughs> right. Um, and we were changed by this process. We were changed be, by hearing people's, what we, what we didn't probably include as much is people's struggle. Um, you saw the Jeanette tear up when she talked about her mother, the, this, you know, her mother, grandmother loved that property. So many people that we talked to were very emotional. It was, this is, and, and I think a lot of people that are away from these kinds of projects just don't understand that once these projects are, th are coming to you, um, it's a very, it's scary. Um, you have to live every day thinking that your life is gonna change forever, that, that you are out, it's out of control. Um, and there's a great feeling to wanna protect that, but not always knowing how and feeling like you're working way against forces that are so far beyond your capability. So we tried to capture that, um, but tried to make it um, uh, honor the honor those feelings, but honor their protect their feeling of protection and, and what they invested in protecting them their their homeland. Does that give you a little picture? <laughs> I've got before I I'll, I'll come to you in just a second. Uh, Lee Brower has a has a lengthy <laughs> uh, comment. I'd like for you to read for okay. the crowd. So unfortunately, because Lee and Sam couldn't be here, we said, well, you can watch it on the Facebook page and make comments. So yay, Lee did. Thank you, Lee. I feel like I'm some kind of an MC or something. <laughs> um, Lee, good evening. I would like to say the experience of this fight for this land was like nothing I have ever experienced in the intensity of this event. Well, I'm tearing up as I write this. Was so intense, so intense, so intense. I, like many others, found I went to sleep thinking of nothing else. I just could not get it out of my mind. Bad dreams. Then when I first was awake again and the first thing in my mind, and in midday, and whenever I had that quiet moment, there it was again. Over and over and over again. We all knew what this would do and what would happen, so I would like you to know how this felt. But it was not just that day, no, it was the next one and the next one, and it never stopped until that day years later when we yell and cried so hard, and I know you heard it in Hampton. That means when they decided to, when Navinia decided not to build the pipeline. 
Uh, I was sure when Barb called me that I wanted to bring back, uh, I was not sure when Barb called me that I wanted to bring these feelings back. Hard, hard, my love goes out to all those who would stand up and fight back just, e and just every now and, just, and then just every now and then we the little people take a win. Thank you, Lee. Thanks, Lee. I'm with, um, uh, I'm on the board of Virginia Interfaith Power and Light, oh, right. and um, I, I had the pleasure of uh, visiting the Limperts, um, and the, the, just the old growth forest that was gonna cut right through that, I think they had a tree that was like 300 years old. Right, Una, <laughs> Una. Um, but, um, I think that this is a really good example. It's, it's appropriate that we're at the History Museum because stories are so important for affecting people. You know, you can talk about endangered species and beautiful forest and everything, but ultimately what gets people's hearts is how it affects people and how it affects their stories. And, and unfortunately, a lot of times the people that are most affected in, in environmental situations like this are the poor and people without, um, people without a lot of uh, power in our society. So thank you for telling these stories. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Julian. A question. Uh, I was interested to understand the timeline between when you first started and when you finished. How long was the time from the first meeting till the uh, the film was produced? And also, what was the milestone at that point that you stopped? Had the pipeline been stopped at that point? No, not at that point. Um, I, when was I'm bad with dates. <laughs> when did we meet? <laughs> <laughs> well, we filmed for three seasons, and the yeah. reason we knew that is because we definitely experienced fall, winter, and spring. Yeah. And so yeah, we would we, go. We first went up there. It was like fall. That was like there was the one shot where it's like snowing. That was like the first time we went up to film. Um, and then, yeah, we went up again in spring and summer, and then. I think the I think. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. This feels like forever ago, honestly. I, know. I think we just figured that was uh, we couldn't take we couldn't have any more footage. You know, it's yeah. like we had yeah. so much that we lot. had to figure out what to do with it. And so we came to sort of a natural conclusion. And also, um, wasn't it the end of the semester? Also that, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> so um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. At a certain point, there was just so much, and I think we had also. Uh, I mean. There's always people that we could have kept talking to, but I feel like it felt like we were sort of at, it was a natural sort of like we had um, sort of like, and we could start to see an arc as to how we would structure the film, I think. Um, and no, when it was finished, the ACP hadn't been uh, defeated at that point. Um, it was uh, when? 2018. 2018, and this was done in 2016? 2017? 17, 18. <laughs> yeah. Also, it took us nine months to edit, right? Yeah, there was a lot of lot of footage, <laughs> um, and we actually we did sort of like going like past that. We did actually have intentions and still might of uh, doing sort of a sequel or an ongoing project, whether that's another film or some other form. Um, I live in New York now, so it's been a little bit difficult to like keep working on on it, but. Uh, yeah, the, the sort of intention was to keep keep going. Yeah. Yeah, we do talk about doing an addendum. Um, yeah. It would be nice to hear the flips, you know, the end, like what happens after there's a win. And yeah, it's so thing. rare that you hear yeah. <laughs> big wins and like success stories, but this, yeah. you know, ultimately is one. So I think it would be nice to have a sequel, an addendum. Yeah. But it's so great that, Kendall, you thought of inviting us because there are so many projects like this, not just in, I mean, in Virginia, but not just in Virginia, and not just gas. I mean, we have a lot of other kinds of um, industry, industrial situations that are coming into communities and neighborhoods where people feel that they don't know what to do and, they're, and it feels threatening and they're trying to protect their homes and their livelihoods. So this film, you could put it just almost anywhere, you know? 
Um, it, and so we felt like there's some relevance beyond just Bath County. Um, and we're grateful to be able to show it here because in this area, um, it's not a new pipeline, but it's an expansion of a pipeline, the um, Virginia Reliability Project. And so there's relevance to what's happening for communities and people here right now. Um, and that was why this felt like such perfect timing um, to invite us, so thank you. That, that uh, here. actually, you, you, that was prescient for my question. So was this finished in time to be an organizing tool? And um, what was it you feel was part of the, the victory, if that, that was the case? And, and, and the other part with the follow-up was, are you actively using this in organizing against other pipelines? I think so, yeah. Yeah, we uh, toured it around the state um, and had, yeah, screenings just like this and talked to people. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, it's every, every little bit helps and at the time it maybe didn't necessarily feel like this was gonna be, you know, a big splash, but it's like every little, every little thing helps, I think. Well, Jeff knows. <laughs> Jeff, uh, we showed the film 40 times, not all of us, 40 times, but we always had a panel of people, local people, plus, you know, especially our friend Tom Hadwin, who's an economist, who's awesome. So Tom often came, but we tried to have people with a perspective to share, knowledge, expertise, um, but also local people involved in, in whatever project was happening. So, but I think we could take credit for stopping the so, yeah. Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll say this, we, we did spread a lot of awareness through those meetings that we had. You know, we'd had them at uh, Virginia Wesleyan University, public libraries all over Tidewater. Uh, they were pretty much detached from the project, uh, except for what we brought to the streets and then brought to the libraries. Um, as a side note, my uh, retirement place that I bought over 30 years ago is in that valley, and m those people in the movie live down the mountain from where my place is. I bought uh, six and an eighth acres in 30 some years ago for under $10,000, and I've been looking forward to it ever since. When they decided they were going to build this thing, it was like someone tore my heart out. That they're not kidding when they tell you how beautiful this place is. It's just unbelievable in uh, its majesticness, and if that's a word. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, definitely sympathize with the full-time residents, and um, glad that uh, this thing was defeated. We got two more to kill now, so thanks. I appreciate you uh, making the comment about this being a good venue to show this film because we very much see ourselves as a place where the community can come in and see their home, see their own story reflected in some way, or a place where we can just stand aside and let you tell your own story. That's uh, one of the harder things to do when, when you're in a history museum is let folks have their say. So we do try to do that. I grew up in the North Carolina mountains in Avery County, right on the Anyway, all very familiar scenery and uh, yeah, like folks here have an attachment to their environment. We mountain folk have an attachment to our environment as well and you're going to get pushback when you start messing with that. I, one of the only times that I can remember all of my family agreeing on one thing up there because they are politically, yeah, way over here, um, opposite ends was, <laughs> Uh, where I grew up there, there was a development of large hotels, condos on the mountain tops. It became, became very fashionable in the 80s. And the one time I saw the entire community get together was to demand uh, ridge laws to prevent those scars. I, don't get me started. <laughs> those scars from appearing at the tops of these beautiful mountains. So. Uh, enough about me, <laughs> the, the scenery just, you know, it touched me as well. Uh, anyone else got a, got a thought, a question? We have, we have, yeah, we've got time. 
Oh, okay, hear you first. Oh. Well, I don't think I have a question that uh, yet, but I, I certainly had many thoughts stirred by this film, and um, you know, in, in one one uh, segment, uh, people talked about their fears. Uh, should that pipeline, if it had been built, uh, should it explode and what it would do? And, uh, and I'm, you know, and immediately took my mind to two weeks ago with the, the pipeline bur um, explosion in Strasburg in Northern Virginia. And I mean, I, even, I know of that town because I have cousins who live there. Um, and uh, I think I read that that was a 26 inch pipeline. So much smaller in diameter than, than, the, than the ACP would have been. And uh, I've now it's uh, I guess because I've been reading about it online, all, all kinds of the algorithm is bringing me all kinds of pictures of it, and there's some drone footage of this explosion uh, in the in the mountains of that area, and it it looks pretty devastating. And thank goodness no human life was damaged because of this, but certainly a lot of uh, of of nature was damaged, a lot of trees, a lot of uh, beautiful area, and it, it looks terrible. Um, and then that takes my mind to what I know is happening in southeastern Virginia, and this is uh, the Canadian corporation, TC Energy, is, has hopes to build a, a pipeline that, well, a, se a segment of it would go from Petersburg uh, through um, some mostly rural uh, s cities and then end up in Chesapeake. And uh, I know there are people who are, who are already organizing and, and working against that. Um, but I, I've even volunteered with, with some of the groups to go out and, and talk to people in some of the neighborhoods where this pipeline is proposed. In one neighborhood in Suffolk, it's a, it's a brand new neighborhood. I mean, it look, I live in Norfolk, so I mean, to me, it looks, it looks this neighborhood looks very new. Um, there's a beautiful elementary school, Hill Point Elementary School, and the little flags for this proposed pipeline are really very close to this school. And um, on the couple of Saturday mornings, I've spent going to knock on doors and to share pamphlets about, you know, just to, and to just talk to anybody who's willing to talk, you know, how much do you know about this pipeline? Um, it's been interesting. And many people do not know about this proposed pipeline. And then, and I would see an age differential if I encountered a uh, somebody who was on the younger end of the spectrum, and especially if they seemed to be a parent, they were concerned and they wanted more information. If I encountered older folks, especially older folks who were, who were uh, white, um, and this neighborhood, very interestingly, is a, it seemed to be very mixed in terms of African-American folks and black folks, and, um, and uh, the, the older white folks, ap men, absolutely, they, that pipeline is the best thing going, we need that, and so it was just very interesting to get these different perspectives, and, um, but as a mother myself, seeing that school in those little flags where they want to put this pipeline is uh, very disconcerting. Um, and so another a question that came up in my mind and I don't think you have an answer, but in, in, in seeing how many people you were able to connect with up in Bath in that beautiful area who knew they had to do something to, to raise their voice about this pipeline and then finding kind of resistance to that in this Suffolk neighborhood that I spent two Saturday mornings uh, knocking on doors. Um, I just, I got a sense, well, one of, one of, the, one of, your, uh, one of your interviewees talked about, I would like these builders to come here and just sit here for a while and let this area sink in and then think about what that pipeline means. I'm not, I'm not quoting, her, quoting her exactly, but I'm thinking, okay, is there something about being rural that gives a mind more time to think, <laughs> maybe? And then in this neighborhood that I've, you know, this new suburban neighborhood, also just beautiful in its way, um, that life is still so busy, you know, and, and you know, and, and that you can't stop and think. 
So I don't, I, and I just think that there's, uh, and this Canadian corporation, I think, is trying to benefit off of that, of people not thinking about this. And uh, so I just encourage people, look up, try to look up what they're calling the Virginia Reliability Project and uh, Mountain Valley Pipeline, that's still going on in the western part of the state. They, this, this is not a good time to be building new pipelines. Thank you for this beautiful movie. Thank you. Thank you. We've got time for uh, one more. Um, so congratulations. Um, Barb, Barb's, Barb's amazing. We know Barb. We love Barb. Um, I, I think um, I'm also in the environmental space. I've been in my role for a little over a year now. I think the thing that you realize um, is how many pipelines are being proposed, um, new or, or what they call expansion, and um, how much work this actually really is when you get on the ground, right? And the lack of consideration from some of these, uh, these companies. Um, you know, when you have some of these projects that will go through fragile bodies of water and delicate ecosystems, the one uh, that Kim was just mentioning uh, will go through a veteran cemetery. Um, it'll go through uh, Nasman River and, you know, this, you know, low-income community. So it's environmental, it's quality of life, it's, you know, so I'll tie this in by saying when, when you're speaking to these people as part of this documentary, when folks on the ground were organizing and trying to get this thing stopped, what was, what was your sense of their spirit, their, their mentality of how they wanted to get this done and what were some of the points maybe that they wanted to just really get through to the people that wanted to get this project done and um, I guess uh, inevitably they, it was stopped but what was their thinking, their mentality? Well, um, a, a couple of things. One thing is that um, uh, when you're faced with something like this, you found people that felt the same way, that felt concerned. And then meeting together is very empowering, you know, for, for people to meet and have conversations and be concerned and share your concerns with people who all understand what you're talking about. So empowerment is, is crucial um, to taking any other action, to making any other step. And I think people found strength in each other and knowing that they weren't alone. Um, and also people, I think when uh, you're, you're dealing with something so huge, um, you need to f come, something, you have to get something, some other kind of gumption, right? Because otherwise you could, it, it feels like you're, you, you're gonna lose, right? So I think these people felt like they had to bring something to the table. I don't know that in their regular lives they would agree on everything, just like you're talking about. Um, I don't think they'd ever Definitely dealt not. with any of that, <laughs> right? So, but uh, there, there was this strength that came from having a shared, shared values and knowing that they were in they weren't alone and so definitely by you know two people make more than two you know two people make it takes more um what's the word i'm trying to get it's exponential you know coming together is exponential um and it's uh and i think they felt a lot of strength from that yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, I was gonna say fear, desperation, <laughs> because I mean, you know, as as Lee commented, like it's nightmarish, um, and I think you know a lot of that is like fears of losing the future, fears of like having you know your dreams ripped out from under you. But I think that is the opposite side of the coin of like the only thing that solves fear is a feeling of togetherness and empowerment that comes from talking to people and like realizing that you have these shared values and that you have something together that, you know, you, you're willing to fight for it together. I think that's sort of like the, the next step. The fear is initial, but then the coming together is what comes out of it. And I just realized that that's why we ended the film with everybody smiling. Yes. Because <laughs> we were smiling. We had a good time. People were lovely, and there was a lot of love shared in all of our experiences. And we wanted people to see that, you know, there was, there was, there are really challenges, but I think Lee and Sam, you would agree that um, people also had a lightheartedness at times and could share that as well. So we wanted to show 
people feeling, you know, feeling uplifted uh, at the same time. All right. Well, I think we've had a good discussion and a wonderful presentation. Do you folks have any more uh, ideas you'd like to share with us? No, just thank you all so much for coming. Nobody's asked us if we've done any more films. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you done any more films? Why, yes. <laughs> Funny I should ask. We've done a, we did a Quaker a film about a Quaker organization that I belong to. That's it's on YouTube. Um, and then we've done a friend of ours in this process. We've, um, was, we were asked to visit the tribe in western New Jersey, the um, Lenape tribe, and do footage of a number of issues that they're facing with, but also their revitalization in support of their, um, their tribal people. So uh, we've been able to do a few more. There's also the one in Kenya. Oh, and yes, we went to Kenya. We oh, went to wow. Kenya. That's where I got these. Um, we went to Kenya once. once. But we, yeah, yeah, I went twice. But there, there's a school that we were supporting um, and through our friend, a friend here. Um, who's from Kenya. So he, he asked us to come, and we said yes. Yeah. yeah, so we haven't finished that one yet. No. 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 We'll, so we'll we're in process, so look forward yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> go, go, go and find these. So, uh, yeah, we want to look at these documentaries on YouTube. Tell you what, if you will send us links to the History Museum, yeah. and if you will email the History Museum, all of our, num all of our email addresses are on the web page. We'll see that the links get sent to you. Yeah. So, and I'm feeling really expansive. So I ha I made cards of these photos, <laughs> <laughs> and we were selling them. We're not selling them tonight, but I'm going to put them out for you, and you can take some with you. Take a little bit of tonight with you. Yeah, by all means, uh, before you leave, take uh, take a moment to to look at these wonderful photographs. It uh, where I grew up, that's a creek. <laughs> and on either side of that creek is a holler, just so you'll get the geography <laughs> right. So, uh, all right then. Well, thank you for coming out tonight. Thank, thank you, you very for much. your work and a presentation. And uh, remember, uh, one, mo one month from tonight, we'll have Kalita Fairfax in here. So thank you very much. <laughs>